The Premier League is the best, most entertaining, and most unpredictable league in the world. We are told this, ad infinitum, repeated time and time again as though it were some kind of religious mantra, raining down from the Church of Sky Sports as they shake us down for yet another 40 quid a month. But is it actually true? Well, there is certainly a case to be made that the Premier League is the best league in the world now, if you look at the quality of the players and managers throughout the division, though you would expect it to be, and arguably to a much greater extent, given the financial advantages that it now enjoys over every other league. The Premier League does rank first in UEFA's league coefficients, but Manchester United and Newcastle United's group stage exits from this season's Champions League, and Arsenal's first leg defeat against Porto, as I covered in the most recent video on this channel, suggest that the league isn't necessarily quite as dominant as its economic status perhaps suggests that it ought to be. Entertainment is a subjective metric, of course, though there have certainly been some thrilling Premier League games so far this season, and at long last we appear to have at least a three-team title race on our hands. As for unpredictable, well, that's just plainly false. One team has won five out of the last six Premier League titles, and they are the favourites to win it again this season, which is less diversity of champions than La Liga and Serie A, and the exact same as Ligue 1 during that time. Only one team outside of the rich six, which has recently become a rich seven, has won the league over the last 28 years, and only two teams outside of the rich seven, namely Leicester when they won the league in 2016, and Everton all the way back in 2005, has managed to break into the top four over the last 20 plus years. The Premier League is therefore extremely predictable, more so in fact, in terms of the top four or six teams each season, than a lot of other major leagues in world football. The rich six, now the rich seven, constitute 35% of the division and invariably jostle for the European places, with only one or two surprise packages breaking into typically UEFA's secondary or now tertiary competitions each season, while everyone else is at risk of relegation. Personally, I think that is boring and rubbish and poo and wee, and I was recently asked to take a look at who might have won the Premier League and have qualified for the Champions League over the years, were it not for the rich six wielding so much power and control. I don't suppose that it actually would have been Arnold Schwarzenegger. It is worth noting that the big six hasn't always been a big six. For a long time, people referred to the top four of Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool and Chelsea. It only became a six due to the shrewd management, strategic location and lucrative stadium move of Tottenham Hotspur and the purchase of Manchester City, effectively, by the United Arab Emirates. You will see their control therefore increase, along with Chelsea post Abramovich, and the ability for other teams to break into the top six weaken as this video goes on. But without further ado, here is who would have been the Premier League title winners every season without the big six, along with every team outside of the big six to have cracked the top six during that time. 1992-93, Aston Villa. There was no Big Six when the Premier League was first created. In fact, it was the first division so-called Big Five, as they were collectively referred to, who led the breakaway from the Football League in search of greater revenues for themselves. The Big Five was made up of Arsenal, Everton, Liverpool, Manchester United and Tottenham, who finished 10th, 13th, 6th, 1st and 8th in the inaugural Premier League campaign. Yes, that's right, this was a time in which just being part of the perceived Big Five wasn't enough in of itself to guarantee that more than one of you would actually finish in the top five, or even necessarily that you would make the top half, and there was still some degree of unpredictability. Norwich, for example, who finished third and qualified for the UEFA Cup, were almost relegated from the first division the previous season, Fourth-placed Blackburn Rovers had only just been promoted, and Leeds United, who won the final First Division title, plummeted all the way down to 17th place, finishing just two points above the relegation zone. I know, I know. Excitement, unpredictability, and some degree of jeopardy for the richest clubs? It'll never catch on. Thank God we did away with all of that. The title winners for the 1992-93 season, without the big six then, was actually the league runners-up, Aston Villa, 
who spent most of the season in a closely fought title race with Manchester United under the management of Ron Atkinson before three defeats from their last three games made things a lot more comfortable for Atkinson's former club, who won their first top flight league title since the 1960s. This was a Villa team which starred the likes of Steve Staunton, Ray Houghton and Dean Saunders, in addition to former Manchester United man Paul McGrath and future Manchester United players like Mark Bosnich and Dwight York, and though they felt a tenth in the Premier League the following season, they finally overcame Manchester United, beating them 3-1 at Wembley in the final of the League Cup. 1993-94 Blackburn Rovers Blackburn Rovers may only have won promotion to the Premier League in 1992, but by this stage, everybody already knew that they were likely to become a force. Local-born multi-millionaire Jack Walker had made it his stated aim to make Blackburn the best club in England, while threatening to make Manchester United look cheap, and they were the biggest spenders during the first few years of the Premier League. Had there been a big six at this time, they would undoubtedly have been in it. Under the guidance of Kenny Dalgleish, and with a team which starred Tim Sherwood, Colin Hendry, Graham Lasso, and the Premier League's second highest scorer that season, with 31 goals, Alan Shearer, Blackburn climbed to second, finishing eight points behind Manchester United and qualifying for the UEFA Cup. The league was still unpredictable, as Chelsea, Spurs and Everton all finished in the bottom half, just two points above the drop in Everton's case. Meanwhile, Newcastle, Leeds and Wimbledon joined Manchester United and Blackburn inside of the top six. 1994-95 Blackburn Rovers In one of only two occasions in the history of the Premier League, the 1994-95 season saw a non-Big Six team win the title. That team, unsurprisingly, was Blackburn Rovers, who had further strengthened since finishing second, most notably through the arrival of Chris Sutton, who had scored 25 goals for Norwich City the previous season, and would partner Alan Shearer up front. Sutton struck 15 times during his debut campaign, meanwhile Shearer won the Golden Boot with 34 goals, as Blackburn finished one point above Manchester United, following a dramatic final day of the season, in which Ferguson's side failed to win away at West Ham. Nottingham Forest, Leeds United, and Newcastle United all finished inside the top six. Meanwhile, Chelsea, Arsenal, Everton, and Man City all finished in the bottom half. And Villa, who were runners-up in the first Premier League campaign, came within inches of getting relegated. 1995-96, Newcastle United. Blackburn fell from 1st to 7th following their Premier League title win, meanwhile Villa and Everton propelled themselves back into the top 6, and Manchester City were relegated. I am a broken record at this stage I know, but it's this degree of chaos and excitement that should happen every season, and that makes football fun. Newcastle United began the Premier League era outside of English football's top flight, but they continued their impressive ascent in the 1995-96 season under former star man Kevin Keegan following a season of intense spending. The likes of Les Ferdinand, David Ginola and Tino Espria were brought to St. James's Park as Newcastle leapfrogged Blackburn as the division's biggest spenders, spending more than twice as much as any other club. Manchester United, despite making a big profit in the transfer market, reclaimed the title, but Newcastle only finished four points behind them. 1996-97 Newcastle United It would have been back-to-back -back Premier League titles for Newcastle United in the 1990s were it not for the Big Six. Or, more specifically, were it not for Manchester United, just as it would have been for Blackburn before them. Once again, Newcastle outspent the Red Devils, beating them to the punch to sign Alan Shearer for a world record fee, but even his golden boot winning tally of 25 goals couldn't get them over the line. Seven points was the gap this time around, meanwhile Aston Villa were the only other non-Big Six team to crack the top six as the league's hierarchies began to take shape. 1997-98 Leeds United Peter Ridsdale became the chairman of his hometown club, Leeds United, in 1997, setting about with a novel strategy of spending money that the club didn't have, which was borrowed against future earnings. Should we have spent so heavily in the past? Probably not, but we lived the dream. And for a while, it worked. The 1997-98 season saw the arrival of David Hopkin, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank and Alf Inger Haaland, and Leeds climbed to fifth under George Graham. 
you may already be starting to notice that, whereas at the beginning of the 1990s, the best team outside of the Big Six finished second, by 1997-98, they were already finishing outside of the top four. Arsenal, meanwhile, dethroned Manchester United to win the title, as Arsene Wenger totally reshaped English football, Spurs fell to 14th, only four points above the relegation zone, and late Big Six inductees Manchester City were actually relegated this season, not from the Premier League, but from what is now the Championship, dropping down into the third tier of English football, where they would compete alongside the likes of Chesterfield, York City, and Northampton Town the following season. 1998-99, Leeds United. The spending continued at Leeds United in Ridsdale's second season, aided by impressive academy graduates like Jonathan Woodgate and Paul Robinson, as George Graham was replaced by David O'Leary, and Leeds climbed up into fourth, qualifying for the UEFA Cup. At the time, only the top three teams made the Champions League, and that was Manchester United, Arsenal and Chelsea. For the very last time, up to now at least, Two other non-Big Six teams cracked the top six, namely West Ham and Aston Villa, who finished fifth and sixth. 1999-2000, Leeds United. Becoming the first team to go three for three in terms of Premier League titles, if you remove the Big Six, Leeds went wild in the summer of 1999, signing Darren Huckabee, Michael Bridges, Danny Mills and Michael Dubry, among others, and it gained them an extra place in the league table up into third, which meant Champions League qualification. You will never guess what Ridsdale did with that extra revenue. Well, you're about to find out. Aston Villa, meanwhile, clung on to a top six spot, just about, as all of the big six, except for Man City, finished inside of the top half for only the second time. 2000 to 2001, Leeds United. Leeds United are the only team who would have won four straight Premier League titles were it not for the big six. But at what cost? Ridsdale put the club's Champions League money to good use, signing Rio Ferdinand from West Ham for a British record £18 million fee, which also made him the most expensive defender in the history of world football. Olivier Decor, Mark Viduca, and Dominic Matteo were also signed for substantial fees, which wouldn't have been an issue were it not for the fact that Ridsdale wasn't just spending that season's Champions League revenue, but the guarantee of future revenue in seasons to come. Despite their spending, Leeds missed out on the Champions League in the 2000-01 season, finishing one point behind Liverpool, and though they were the highest ranked non-Big Six team, that meant the disaster was about to strike. Ipswich Town, meanwhile, were surprised top six gate crashers, finishing fifth in their first season following promotion. It was a big season for Manchester City, meanwhile, who returned to the Premier League, but only to be relegated once again. It would be fair to say the citizens certainly weren't considered part of the big six just yet. 2001-02, Newcastle United. Having missed out on the Champions League, when they had banked on Champions League revenue and gate receipts, Leeds had a huge hole in their finances. Instead of looking to cut their losses though, Ridsdale decided to have one last big push to get back into the Champions League. Of course he did, and plugged that gap by regaining that extra revenue. Ridsdale's optimism owed to the fact that, for the first time, the top four, rather than only the top three Premier League teams, would earn Champions League qualification. In came Robbie Keane, Robbie Fowler, and the disastrous Seth Johnson for huge fees, and, well, Leeds finished fifth, and that financial black hole had just doubled in size. Newcastle, by contrast, enjoyed a renaissance under Sir Bobby Robson, climbing from 11th back up into 4th, and stealing that brand new Champions League qualification spot, 5 points ahead of Leeds. The rest of the big 6, excluding Man City, once again all finished inside of the top half of the table. 2002-03, Newcastle United. The Robson revolution continued at St. James's Park as the Magpies leapfrog Liverpool up into third, retaining their Champions League status. They were a long way off the title, unlike during the Keegan days, but these were still good times to be a Newcastle fan, as the Champions League brought trips to Juventus, Inter Milan, and Barcelona. Leeds' arses had completely dropped out by this stage, as a series of fire sales saw them dragged into a relegation scrap, and academy graduate Jonathan Woodgate actually departed mid-season in a move to Newcastle. 
Three years after Jack Walker's death, his family trust oversaw Blackburn's return to the top six under Graham Souness. As a team starring the likes of Brad Friedel, Damien Duff, and former Manchester United strike partners Dwight York and Andy Cole, only lost 10 games all season. 2003-04, Newcastle United. Newcastle's 2003-04 Premier League campaign wasn't anywhere near as impressive as the two which preceded it, as Robson's men fell from 3rd to 5th place, drawing an incredible 17 games and only clinging on to any form of European qualification by the narrowest of margins. In Europe, by contrast, they had a great time, missing out to Partizan Belgrade in UEFA Champions League qualifying, but going on to reach the semi-finals of the UEFA Cup, following victories against the likes of Basel, Mallorca, and PSV. Aston Villa returned to the top six after four years away, tied on points with Newcastle, as Leeds United's further demise continued with their relegation, though things were to get much worse still, with relegation to League One and administration. Unlucky Pete, it was worth a go. Oh, and Manchester City not only returned to the top flight, but actually managed to stay up. 2004-05, Everton. Following the 2003-04 season, with Leeds' relegation and Newcastle's already evident decline, it was felt that the status of the new top four was pretty rock solid. That made Everton's achievements of finishing inside of the top four for the first time during the Premier League era on a shoestring budget under David Moyes all the more impressive. It was a season of almost historically low points tallies as the Toffees took fourth ahead of their Merseyside rivals with only 61 points. Meanwhile, despite missing out on the top four, Liverpool also qualified for the Champions League after they were crowned as European champions in the most extraordinary fashion in Istanbul. Bolton also cracked the top six, finishing tied on points with the European champions, and only three points behind Everton, under the main man, Big Sam Allardyce. This was an iconic Bolton team, featuring the likes of UC Askelainen, Stelian Janakopoulos, even Campo, Fernando Hierro, and of course, the irrepressible JJ Kocha. The ultimate Premier League streets won't forget 11. 2005-06, Blackburn Rovers. Thought you'd got rid of them, did you? Blackburn Rovers might not have been in Premier League title contention by the mid-2000s, or, you know, anywhere close, but they were an exceptionally solid team under Mark Hughes. With David Bentley and Morton Gamst Pedersen on the flanks, and Craig Bellamy through the middle, Blackburn were a menace, winning only one game fewer that season than Arsene Wenger's Arsenal in their last season at Highbury. Five of the big six occupied the top five positions, beginning to solidify their hegemony. Meanwhile, Manchester City finished 15th. 2006-07. Everton. David Moyes' men got themselves back in Europe in the 2006-07 season by finishing 6th, as the big six, barring Man City, once again had the top five positions on lockdown. For only the second season, but tellingly, for the second successive season, only one non-Big Six team cracked the top six. Manchester City, meanwhile, only finished four points above the drop. 2007-08. Everton. It was Everton in pole position once again in the 2007-08 season for the Premier League title, in a would-be world without the Big Six, as a terrible season at Tottenham under Martin Yol and Juan de Ramos saw them fall to 11th and Everton climb into 5th. Albeit, Spurs did win the League Cup, their most recent piece of silverware. Everton added Phil Jagielka, Leighton Baines and Yakubu to their ranks, and that fantastic recruitment was enough to get them into the UEFA Cup. Tottenham's tumble, and Man City still not being Emirati owned yet, meant that another non-Big Six team, Aston Villa, crept into sixth under Martin O'Neill. 2008-09, Everton. The 2008-09 season was a direct repeat of the 2007-08 season in terms of Everton and Aston Villa finishing 5th and 6th, and therefore being the top two in a hypothetical non-Big Six league, although the gap between Everton in 5th and Manchester United in 1st in real life was more than 20 points. Everton had a really good team in the 2008-09 season, featuring the likes of Howard, Neville, Lescott, Jagielka, Baines, Arteta, Pinar, Fellaini, Saha, and a young Jack Rodwell. This was peak Moyes ball, and in a big 6-3 world, he'd have been rewarded with a third successive Premier League title. 
More significant still, however, was the fact that Manchester City were acquired by the Abu Dhabi United group in 2008, putting the Premier League on a path towards the now very well-established Big Six elite. Oh no, actually, even more importantly, Hull City played their first ever season of top-flight football and survived. Heck, in the middle of October, they were the highest-ranked non-Big Six team, sitting pretty in third, above Arsenal and Manchester United, meanwhile Spurs were dead last at that time. 2009-10, Aston Villa. If 2008-09 was peak Moyes ball, then 2009-10 was peak O'Neill ball. Newly rich Manchester City made their first ever top six finish, climbing to fifth, but Villa finished above both Liverpool and Everton in sixth. This was the team, and it makes me sick to think that there will be some of you watching this who are too young to remember, and when I say sick, what I mean is bitter, and sick, of Stuart Downing, Ashley Young, James Milner, Stan Petrov, John Carew, Gabby Agbon Lahore, and the main man Emil Heskey. I played an ungodly amount of hours as Villa on that season's FIFA, with Agbon Lahore's 96 pace, making him virtually unplayable. Anyway, personal video game anecdotes aside, Villa were really good, and though they only finished in 6th, 22 points off top spot, remove the big 6, and they'd have been title winners. 2010-11, Everton. For the first time in the Premier League era, the top six was just the big six in the 2010-11 season, as Manchester City asserted their new status as part of the elite, and no one outside of that elite was able to break in. Everton came the closest, finishing seventh, four points behind their Merseyside rivals, having drawn just a few too many games. Fun fact, Jermaine Beckford was actually Everton's joint highest scorer in all competitions that season, tied with Louis Saha on 10 goals. Alright, it's not that fun, admittedly, I just found it surprising. I always had Beckford down as a bit of an Everton flop, so for him to have been their joint top scorer, do you know what, never mind, forget I ever said anything. 2011-12, Newcastle United. The big six were disrupted in the 2011-12 season by none other than Alan Pardew's Magpies. In only their second season back in the Premier League, following relegation to the Championship, signings like Johan Kabay and Demba Barr joined mid-season by Papis Cisse and the wonderful individual ability of Hatem Ben Arthur turned Newcastle into that season's surprise packages. They finished fifth, Four points behind Spurs in fourth, though neither side qualified for the Champions League by virtue of Chelsea being crowned as European champions, despite finishing sixth. 2012-13, Everton. In David Moyes' last season at Goodison Park, the Toffees were once again the best of the rest. Everton only scored 55 goals, 16 fewer than Liverpool who finished one place below them, but a more miserly defence than even the title winners Manchester United was enough to secure them a spot in sixth. Unfortunately, due to Wigan, who were relegated, winning the FA Cup, and Swansea, who finished ninth, winning the League Cup, that sixth place finish didn't come with any European football. 2013-14, Everton. Roberto Martinez, the man who had denied Everton of European football by winning the FA Cup at Wigan the previous season, replaced David Moyes in the summer of 2013, who had himself replaced Alex Ferguson at Manchester United. The duo had extremely contrasting fortunes in their first season at their new clubs. Moyes was sacked shortly before the end of the season, and Manchester United finished 7th, finishing not just outside of the top 6 or the top 4 for the first time during the Premier League era, but actually outside of the top 3, which was the lowest that Ferguson had finished, post-92. Everton, meanwhile, rose to 5th under Martinez, finishing above both Spurs and Man United, as would-be title winners in a big 6 for a universe. 2014-15 Southampton. Normal service was resumed in the 2014-15 season, as not a single outsider cracked the top six. Everton fell all the way to 11th, though that would be pretty good going compared to their current predicament. Meanwhile, Southampton, owing to shrewd recruitment, managerial appointments, and an excellent academy, were the best of the rest in seventh. It was only the Saints' third season back in the big time, having spent as many seasons in League One as the Premier League over the last five years, but under Ronald Koeman, building on the fine work that Maurizio Pochettino and Nigel Atkins had done, they were a force to be reckoned with. 
This was the Saints team of Klein, Schneiderlin, Wanyama, Tadic, Mane, Alderweireld and, who could forget, the big man Graziano Palla, who scored 12 in the league and 16 in all competitions that season. Southampton won their first hypothetical Premier League title then, and in real life, only two points separated them and Liverpool. 2015-16, Leicester City. The second and last time that a non-Big Six team has actually won the Premier League title, there can be no doubt that Leicester City's triumph in 2016 is the greatest upset not just in the Premier League, but perhaps in the entire history of club football. From a great escape the previous season, having spent much of the campaign dead last, losing their manager Nigel Pearson and replacing him with a man who had most recently been sacked following just four games in charge of Greece, in addition to losing their player of the season, to winning the Premier League title as 5,000 to 1 outsiders, that truly is fairy tale stuff. Leicester didn't just win the title, they won it by 10 whole points, only losing three games all season. For the first time in seven years, two non-Big Six teams cracked the top six, as Liverpool and Chelsea finished in 8th and 10th, with Southampton taking 6th, in what was, and still is their highest league finish, during the Premier League era. 2016-17 Everton from the chaos and tumult of the 2015-16 season, normal service was sadly resumed in 2016-17, with any hope that finances would no longer dictate league positions immediately being vanquished. The big six made up the top six, quite comfortably in fact, with Liverpool bouncing back to make the Champions League and Chelsea actually managing to win the league. Everton, meanwhile, were the best of the rest for the first time in a few years again, finishing 7th under Ronald Koeman, as Romelu Lukaku scored 25 Premier League goals, a tally bettered only by Harry Kane. 2017-18 Burnley Possibly the biggest overachievement in this video, other than Leicester in 2016, at least relative to a club's resources, Sean Dyche qualifying for Europe with Burnley in 2018 was a truly sensational achievement. The Clarets finished 16th the previous season, just six points above the drop, and didn't exactly go wild in the transfer market, with Chris Wood from Leeds and Jack Cork from Swansea being their largest outlays. Once again, the top six was just the big six, with a massive drop-off to Burnley in seventh, but take nothing away from that achievement, as Burnley still finished above several teams with much bigger budgets. When one frames it as I am in this video that, without the big six, Burnley would have won the 2017-18 Premier League title, above the likes of Everton, Newcastle, Leicester and West Ham, that is quite some feat. 2018-19 Wolves Yet again, the top six was just the big six in 2018-19, but in their first season back in the top flight, it was Wolves who finished in seventh. Following a takeover by wealthy Chinese owners, a close relationship with super agent George Mendes, and the recruitment of some outstanding Portuguese players, Wolves were miles too good for the championship the previous season, and while seventh might have exceeded expectations, it was hardly the shock of Burnley the previous season. Once again, the gap between Wolves in 7th and Manchester United in 6th was quite a large one at 9 points. 2019-20 Leicester City Having faded following their remarkable title win, Leicester City were resurgent under Brendan Rodgers. In his first full season, the Foxes became the first non-Big Six club since they themselves won the title to gatecrash the top six, finishing 5th, above Tottenham and Arsenal, having spent almost all season, until the last two games, inside the top four. In January, Leicester was second, and even in July, post-lockdown, they were in third. Five wins from their last 22 games, that is over half a Premier League season, denied them of Champions League football, but in a big 6-3 world, they'd have won a second title. 2020-21 Leicester City it was an all-too-familiar feeling for Leicester City supporters in the 2020-21 season, as they spent basically the entire season in the Champions League places, only to drop out with two games to go. The collapse wasn't quite as spectacular this time around, but three wins from their last nine games was always likely to be punished. 
The Foxes still finish fifth above Arsenal and Spurs once again, and only one point behind Chelsea, as well as winning the FA Cup, so hardly a disastrous season all round. Certainly, it will be downhill from there over the next couple of years. For the first time since Leicester's 2015-16 title win, and for only the second time in more than 10 years, two non-Big Six teams gatecrashed the top six, as Leicester were joined by West Ham, who were a completely different team under David Moyes during his second stint in charge. 2021-22, West Ham. Speaking of the devil, West Ham fell from 6th to 7th in the 2021-22 season, albeit they did make it through to the semi-finals of the Europa League, as the top 6, once again, was just the rich 6. The gap was only a narrow one, as Moyes' men finished just 2 points behind a Manchester United team, managed by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, Michael Carrick, and Ralph Rangnick. The three of them at different times, it should be said. They weren't co-managers all season. I'm glad we cleared that one up. 2022-23, Newcastle United. This is a bit of a cheat because, as of 2021, the rich six or big six became a rich seven or big seven, and though Newcastle certainly outperformed expectations in finishing fourth so early on in their development under Saudi ownership, it doesn't really feel in keeping with the spirit of the video. I guess you could make the same argument about Blackburn and Newcastle themselves in the 90s though, albeit to a much lesser extent. There was a non-rich 7 team that cracked the top 6 against all of the odds last season though, and that was Brighton, who were sensational in their first season under Roberto De Zerbi. Despite losing Ivis Basuma, Mark Kukurea, and Neil Mope during the summer window, among others, and turning a massive profit, followed by Leandro Trossard in the January window who joined Arsenal, Brighton went from strength to strength, only winning one game fewer than big spending Newcastle, and finishing above Tottenham and enormous spending Chelsea, who basically signed all of their players and staff. Before I leave you all, oh no, please don't cry, a quick look at this season, followed by a macro analysis. Brighton are having another good season, up in 7th, meanwhile Chelsea's status as a rich 7 club itself could come under threat if they have another 3 or 4 seasons like this one, currently languishing in 10th. This season's top dogs outside of the rich 7, and actually gatecrashing them in a big way, is undoubtedly Aston Villa though. With 11 games to go this season, Villa are 4th in the Premier League table, just ahead of Spurs and Manchester United at the time of this recording, as they look to become one of the very few non-rich 6, now rich 7 clubs, to have cracked the top 4 over the last 20 years. Overall then, without the so-called Big 6, Everton would have won more titles during the Premier League era than anyone else with 8, Newcastle United would be second with seven, Leeds United would be next up with four, and, you know, without them, they probably wouldn't have missed out on the Champions League and been sent on a death spiral towards League One. Blackburn Rovers and Leicester City would be on three apiece as the only two non-Big Six teams to have actually won the Premier League. Aston Villa would have two, and Southampton, Burnley, Wolves and West Ham would each have won one. There would, therefore, have been 10 different Premier League title winners rather than the 7 that we've actually had, and the most successful team would only have won 8, as opposed to Manchester United, who have won 13. The depressing part is how few teams have broken into that top 6 over the last 15 years. In 6 out of the last 13 seasons, the top 6 has been the exact same 6 teams, namely the Big 6, and it has been 24 years, going all the way back to 1999, before Chelsea were bought by Abramovich, Manchester City by Abu Dhabi, and obviously Newcastle by Saudi Arabia, since more than two non-Big 6 teams finished in the top 6. But hey, it is the most unpredictable league in the world. Anyone can beat anyone, they just can't beat them enough times to change how the league table looks at the end of the season, more than once in a blue moon. Anyway, I found that a fun look back on every Premier League season, even if it did make me yearn for a more unpredictable English top flight, like a shameless nostalgia merchant. Don't get me wrong, Manchester City's 100 point season was very impressive, but without the big six that season, Burnley would have won the league. And forgive me, but that would be a lot funnier and more entertaining. Anyway, thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, goes without saying, 
Uh, I assume you have all already subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Pot's Armor, uh, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can find all of those things that I just mentioned, plus a whole lot more, down in the video description below. Cheers.